Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, and I hope you're all doing well. If you're new here, I live in my Forerunner full-time, traveling around shooting landscape photos and making videos like this one, although right now I'm kind of seeking refuge in the desert at my relative's house so that I can avoid sleeping in things like this, and that I get to be in, you know, wearing a short sleeve shirt, sitting outside, filming this video. But anyways, that means I have a little bit of office space and we can sit down in Lightroom and talk about a few of the things that I see that are common mistakes when people first start shooting or first start editing in their photography journey. So that's what this video is gonna be about, but also I want you guys to submit your own photos to be edited here on my channel. So if you wanna do that, if you wanna submit your own photos and see them edited on this channel, make sure you stay tuned and I'm gonna tell you how to do that in this video. Anyways, let's get started. One of the biggest mistakes I see in editing is that people just tend to want to push their sliders too far. What I mean by that is it applies to anything. It could be your shadows, your highlights, your whites, your darks, your exposure, your contrast, everything. People tend to overdo it a lot of the times when they want an image to look more in your face. They want it to stand out. They want it to be oversaturated. Now, conceptually, there's a lot of psychology behind brighter images usually being the ones people prefer or more saturated images being the ones they prefer. It, I think a lot of people probably understand this when I'm saying this, but the images that I had to do the best on social media and stuff are usually ones full of color with a lot of dynamic range that just are really in your face. And my more muted stuff or things that don't have a lot of contrast or a lot of color in them don't do as well. So when you're first starting out, that's the thing you want to do the most is you want to have those images that really stand out on their own. And I'm going to give you a prime example. So I think when I first started out, one thing I always did was I just added too much clarity to my image. So I'm just gonna make this image 35 clarity. And even though it looks okay, maybe you see this and say, wow, that looks pretty good. I don't see this and say the same thing. I like um, more of the soft feel. I like these soft textures in the grass here. I like the softness of that. And I like the ethereal feel of the clouds. And if I just add clarity to the whole image like that, it's gonna add more local contrast and crunchiness to these areas down here. And it's gonna do things to the clouds that I don't like. Now, what I could do, is I could go in and local adjustment specific spots that I want more clarity in. But for the most part, I just like the image overall how it is right now. Obviously, I've already done this edit. And I think in general, just honing back some of those sliders, honing back, and maybe when you add something, only do half of what you think is correct. Now, again, this really comes down to your preference. It's gonna be your artistic expression. But in general, that's what I notice is that people tend to add too much contrast or too much saturation or too much dehaze sliders like that that really just make the image really pop obviously when you first see it but a lot of the times it just kind of ruins the the atmosphere of the image and it, and it might it just degrades in the overall quality of a lot of images now every once in a while increasing your clarity to very high could work for an image maybe it's a texture based image like for example let's go to this image really quick and even though i have minus 14 on my clarity right now i have 23 on the texture and if i inc increase the clarity on this it's not doing a whole lot in, in terms of like making the image look worse, but this could easily be an image that you want more clarity on as an example, because it's a texture based image. This is going to be stuff that you're going to figure out as you're going, but just in general, a rule I always tell people is bring back, you know, if you think something needs 20, maybe only do 10 and that's really going to help you in your journey. So that brings me up to my next concept, which is saturation and controlling your saturation. Something I see too often is that people oversaturate their images or they're just too colorful or they look unnatural. So we're gonna take a look at this image, for example, that I left specifically like this. I have edited this image and I walked away and I've come back to this image now and I say, wow, this is way too saturated. But when I was here, when I was doing this edit, I thought this looked fine. I did the edit and I was like, okay, this is, this is okay. And what you need to understand is that when you add contrast into your image, when you adjust the tone curve, when you adjust even things like white balance, or you're adjusting bringing up your shadows and bringing down your blacks and that kind of thing, which is also adding contrast, your color is going to get more saturated. So a typical thing that I do is I do my whole edit and then I come here to my global adjustment and remove some saturation, usually minus nine to minus 20, somewhere in between there, depending on the image. The other things I do is come in here to the HSL and I kind of adjust a few of the colors specifically. A lot of the times I don't want my images to be as blue because for example, in the snow over here, if I left the blue how it's supposed to be, the snow starts to look too blue. So I come in here and I remove some saturation from just the blue in my HSL. 
the biggest takeaway from this is just to realize that when you are adjusting things like contrast, even if you remove contrast, it's going to affect the saturation in your image. And those are things you need to pay attention to. And like I said, personally, what I do is I just do my whole edit and then I come in and try to adjust the saturation overall. Maybe I do some specific color adjustments based off the image. It just really depends. But the best advice I can give is to just walk away from your image and come back to it later. That is the best thing you can do to help your eyes and just help you have better images overall. Because a lot of the times what will happen is if I, let's say I had exported this and published it, I would have come back and been like, why did I publish this? This is way too saturated. So that's number two. So the next mistake I see pretty often is when people create halo effects in their image using local adjustments. Now I'm going to be using masks in Lightroom that you can check out here if you need to know how to do that or anything like that. But this also applies to whatever editing suite you're using. It, even phones on your app can do it. And what happens is you want to affect a certain part of your image. Let's take this image for example. I'm going to create a radial filter by using Shift M. I'm going to create a pretty big one. And let's say I just wanted to brighten up this island a little bit. So I'm going to come in here, create my radio filter. I'm going to bring my feather down to about 80 and then I'm going to bring up my exposure. And you see, obviously I'm using an extreme method here, but basically what's happening is it's creating this whole area right here that at first, you know, this might look okay. And again, I'm pushing things to the extreme. This is not what I would suggest doing, but what I see happen a lot is people want to affect an area and then it creates this halo around that area. And you can easily tell that was affected by a radio filter or some luminosity masking that wasn't blended very well. And the best way to see this is two things. I've already told you one, which is step away from your image and come back to it. The other one is to zoom out on your image and you're going to really be able to tell and see those haloing effects that happen in your image when you step away with some fresh eyes and you come back and you zoom out. So now we can see that halo really easily here. Now, because the problem is if I zoom in like this, you can't see it. It just doesn't, it, your eyes can't visually see that haloing effect that's happening around the area that you're trying to affect. Now, obviously there's some other solutions to this. Instead of, you know, having my feather be at 79, I could bump it all the way up. That's gonna help the halo a little bit. But again, this is going to come back to the first concept. Do about half of what you think is correct. So right now my exposure is at 0.53. Let's bring it down to, I don't know, 0.21. It's looking even better. Something else I could do is instead of affecting the whole exposure, so let's just reset the whole thing, I can bring up just the whites. And that's only going to affect the white areas, obviously, in this radial filter. And that's going to help create more of a natural glow on that area rather than bringing up the entire exposure. Now, like I said, I can't go into the full concept of everything you're supposed to do, but realistically, the tool you need to know is just to check to see if you can see those haloing effects. This is one of the things I see the most on a lot of people's photography is that they have those little effects where I can see where they added those edits. And it all comes back to the first concept, which is just honing in and <laughs> removing some of those things that you're adding and not pushing those sliders as much as they'll go and just kind of honing it back and making it look more natural and just having a lighter hand in your edit is a pretty big deal. All right, so the next concept that I see that people kind of get stuck on is white balance. And a lot of the times people learn what white balance is and they always want to just have white balance be the perfect amount it's supposed to be based off the light in your image. I did a whole video on this you can check out here and it kind of goes into more depth about my, my personal concepts and my opinions of white balance. And that in landscape photography, it really doesn't matter all that much. As long as you're shooting in raw, whatever white balance you want to set your camera to or once you get into your editing suite, what you want to set it to to make your image look like how you want, that's what's most important. So for example, in this image, I could push my white balance to, let's just go down to 4,500 if I wanted to make it look more blue. Now, this isn't the technical literal correct white balance because obviously there was sun in the sky, but this is what I could do to make the image look like how I want. Or I can bring it up and make it warmer and I could make it really warm and make it really glow that's my editing choice is conceptually, especially in this image, there's nothing to tell the viewer or my eye that something is wrong. So for example, if I were to go to this image and then start adjusting the white balance crazily, you're gonna immediately be able to see that, okay, maybe this is too blue. Now the snow on the mountains looks white, right? So this is another prime example is that if I came in here and used the little dropper tool and adjusted my white balance to those mountains, it's gonna make everything look too blue because those mountains were orange. They were getting hit by sunlight. They were getting hit by that warmth light. And that's kind of the concept that I wanted to talk about with white balance is 
don't get stuck on it needing to be correct or accurate or perfect. Use it as a tool, use it as a way to edit your images. And here's a little bonus tip that you can do is if you ever convert to black and white, your white balance actually matters. So I'm moving my white balance around here and it's really affecting how this black and white image is looking. That's just a little added tip. So white balance doesn't have to be perfect. I highly recommend you check out my video on it just because it talks about the concepts of trying to get it accurate, but also making sure that you're still using it as a tool, use it how you want to use it, but also don't push it to where it makes your image look unbalanced either. And I think that's the most important thing is if there are things in your image that are supposed to look a certain way, snow being white or some tone of white balance around that, or, you know, the ocean being white. Cause for example, like I said, if we do this one more time, my ocean is not supposed to be that blue. It's just not, maybe that's, maybe that's how you want your image to look but I personally do not gravitate towards this image and this would just be too blue for me. All right, so this leads into my next tip, which is don't get caught too much up in the histogram. So the histogram is fantastic for being able to look at your image mathematically and get an idea of if it's too light or too dark. And I actually wanna do a full video on this because I think it's a really interesting concept that I see in a lot of photographers that I follow, a lot of landscape people that I look up to. A lot of their images are really, really dark where they only have like, very small amounts of light in certain spots. And I kind of want to do this video where I go over and look at histograms of all the images that we all gravitate towards or a lot of people tend to love because a lot of the times those histograms are going to be almost com completely dark. They're barely going to have anything in the bright or light values, which I think is an interesting thing because a lot of the times we're taught, you know, don't blow out your highlights and protect all of your shadows those kind of things, especially when you're first learning. Now, I obviously still follow those rules, but I think a lot of the times I get too caught up in making sure my histogram looks like what it's supposed to look like, or I'm too focused on making sure everything is, you know, all the details are there. But we're gonna look at this image really quick, and I'm gonna give you an idea that right now I have areas in the dark areas that are just completely black. They lost all their data. Now, I could bring up the blacks, for example, if I wanted to and get that data back. But I don't think it's necessary. And I think in some images, you want to push your image to the point where you might lose data. The same thing can be said for bright spots. Let's take a look at this particular shot. There are spots in this image that it's not going to tell me, but I know that this is all white and that there's no data here. But those are the spots that are supposed to just be bright white. A lot of landscape photographers are going to tell you or the purists are going to tell you that you need to recover those highlights in an area or bring up those shadows so that you don't lose any data in those spots. But I think there's a time and place to leave things as bright as they're supposed to be. Obviously, if the gradient and the textures of the light look natural, like in this photo that we're looking at right now, it works. Now, obviously, if I brought up the whites more and blew out too much stuff, maybe it's just going to look too bright in this particular image. It doesn't do a good job, but we can go back to this one, for example. If I brought up the shadows more in this, I'm going to start to see all these details here. That's great. Being able to see details is fantastic a lot of the times, but I think for this particular image, I kind of just want it all to be dark. I don't want to be able to see those things. I don't want my viewer to be able to see those things. Now there's tiny little hints of pebbles here, which is great, but for the most part, this entire image on the right-hand side is pretty dark in this spot. And my histogram represents that. And if I just followed my histogram, I would want to bring up those shadows and have more of a gradual representation of my light here. But the reality is I just don't like the way that looks in the photo. And sometimes I personally get too caught up into trying to make my histogram look how I just think it's supposed to look rather than just looking at the concept of the photo. And I think that's really important in all of the concepts that I'm talking about or all these mistakes that I've been talking about come back to the intention of your edit. What do you want your photo to look like and why? And then kind of honing in all of those things and all of those techniques that you've learned and not pushing it too far and then making sure that you you know, do everything you want your image to look like, but not get too caught up in specific concepts. All right, so if you want to submit your own photos to be edited on this channel, there's going to be a Discord link down below. Just follow that link. On the left-hand side, there's going to be a channel called Photo Submission or something along those lines that'll have all the instructions on what to do. I'm going to prioritize raw photos over JPEGs, and I would ask you to only submit one or two photos per person. The rest of the rules will be in there. Check it out. Let's get back to it. All right, so that brings me to my last and final thing, which is talking about the crop tool. Something I think a lot of people don't use enough is the crop tool or spend more time trying to figure out the crops of their images. That's one thing that I've learned from a lot of my viewers is that a lot of the times I see great images and I'm wondering why didn't you crop it this way or why didn't you crop it down 
like this. And those are the things that I ask myself a lot of the times when I look at my own images is what is my intention with the crop? Where do I want my viewer's eye to be? And those questions could be said about pretty much anything in dealing with your edit, but specifically in the crop. So let's take a look at this image. Right now I have this image set by two by one, I think, or 21 by nine for like a desktop background. So my intention with this particular crop that I just picked was for a desktop background. So something else you need to think about is if you ever print your images, you're going to have to use specific crops because yes, you can print your image at pretty much any size, but if you ever wanted to sell your image or sell it to people and you want them to have an easier time getting it framed, your crop is going to matter using a standard crop. So for example, if I went to my two by three here and we cropped it, I'm going to crop where the middle of the frame is right where the middle of the mountain is something like this. And this is going to be my crop. Now that was pretty easy because I said, I want to have a two by three. I'm going to make it two by three so that I can print easier in that aspect ratio. And this is going to be my crop. Now that's also going to apply to things like Instagram or sharing on social media is the crop might matter, but let's just talk about it specifically to helping the viewer's eye know where it's supposed to go and using the crop tool as part of your editing technique. Okay. So let's use this image as a quick example. If I come here into the crop tool and I crop out part of the sky in the top. Let's unlock that and get rid of some of that. The image still looks okay, but now maybe it's the, it's a little bit too close to the edge of this piece of ice and we could add a little bit more back in. Now, what did that really do? Did that help my viewer's eye go to the actual subject? Did it get rid of something that was distracting in my image? Did it help just get rid of some dead space? Those are the questions you have to ask yourself when you're cropping is if I removed it to this and made it more square, did I get rid of too much? Did I get rid of too much of the flow or the look of the image that I'm going for? And personally, I think I did in this particular image is I kind of really like all of this space down here because it allows more movement at the image. It allows me to feel that those waves are circling around this piece of ice. And just by removing just a little bit of the bottom, I don't, get that feeling as much. I, there's too much movement on the edge of the frame and it kind of feels like it's just cut off too much. So I think that this bottom part of the frame is really important, even though there's not a whole lot going on there. But these are the things that I'm thinking about when I'm going into crop and I'm thinking about what an image needs, what it doesn't need, what I can get rid of, how to help my viewer's eye look in the right spot. The same could be said for cropping this image. So even though I have it set by two to th two by three right now, because I went to print this image, what if I wanted more of a square look? What if I wanted my viewer's eye to be a little bit more cropped in so that the, this particular church is seen a little bit more. It's more of the focal point rather than the atmosphere and the church. So this looks really good to me, but it's not very different than this. There's just more stuff to look at in this particular image. I think the biggest takeaway from all of this is just to sit in the crop tool and really think about stuff with intention. And I think that's really the biggest concept from all of these things is just editing with intention. What are you making those changes for? Why are you adding contrast? Why are you removing saturation? Why are you doing these things? Why are you increasing the dehaze tool? You know, those, everything should have a purpose and you should ask yourself why you're doing something and then, you know, take a step back and then maybe remove some of it like in the first step that I talked about. But anyways, I think that's really the most important thing is just editing with intention, especially in the crop tool. The crop tool is so powerful and I don't think enough people are in it. And if you want some tips and tricks or help with your images, you can join my Discord channel down below and there's people in there that could respond. I might respond just giving you some advice on your photos. But anyways, I hope you enjoyed. I hope this was helpful and uh, I'll see you again on the next one next week. Thanks for watching. Later.